Hello, welcome to Soundtown with Russ and Eric. I'm Eric. It's actually Soundtown with Eric and Russ. Is it? Yeah, I don't think that meant. What do you think sounds better? Um, I was just being modest and putting your name first. But, but that's what I, that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought about how Tim and Eric and people would go crazy about it and putting Eric at the end, I didn't want to, you know, further. I think Russ and Eric flows off the tongue a little better. I didn't want to admit Eric that. Russ. Russ and Eric. <laughs> it's okay, you can admit it. Here, I'll, I'll admit it so you don't have to. Okay, that works. Well, th- we're, we're Russ and Eric, Eric and Russ. For people who don't know, we're in a band together called Shark Club. Um, and through that, playing music together, uh, we've been able to travel and meet a lot of really other great uh, artists and musicians that we would like to, I guess, highlight and showcase on a show just like this. Yeah, well, I mean, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, dive into, uh, into how they make their art. Art, fart, shark. Carl, yeah, all that, all that Carl. good stuff, all that and more here in Soundtown. We've been talking about doing a, a uh, I'm looking over here because Eric is literally sitting uh, three inches away from me. Um, we've talked about doing a podcast before, but we never really had um, motivation to really sit down and mm-hmm. do one. And a buddy of mine from college said, hey, I'm putting together uh, a network of shows, podcast shows uh, called Best Available Player. Go check out the website, bestavailableplayer.com. And he asked if we'd be interested in hosting a show. And we said, heck yeah. And now here we are. And on our first episode, we're, we're talking to our, one of our good, good, good friends, David Juro, who plays drums in our band, among a million other bands. And we kind of go into his creative style, how he got into music in the first place, what he's up to now. And I thought it was a really fun conversation. Yeah, we had a great time with him. Uh, he's, got a lot, he's got a lot to say, for sure. Yeah, we had to shut him up because he was talking too much. <laughs> as he as he does well without further ado here's our conversation with him and we'll check back with you after the show enjoy your time in sound town Yo, Eric, have you ever heard of Gaga, the game Gaga? Gaga Ball? Yeah. How have you heard of that? Not me. (laughs) Because I went to summer camp as a kid. (laughs) (laughs) That's literally what David said when I when I said what is Pretty much, yeah. That's 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 it. (laughs) What summer camp had a pit like that? Uh, We didn't even have a pit. It was. Well, like my my sleepaway camp had one, like the the uh, 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 the one week like Jew camp that I did. <laughs> Do you remember when we when we picked him up? Is, we is like, that the same was... one that me and Jake dropped you off at? Exactly yeah. the same one. Okay, cool. Oh wait, did you drop him off, or did you? I thought you picked him up from there. No. Oh, they no, dropped, we dropped you him off. off. Yeah, because because uh, that was the only way he could come to the show. So if we dropped That's him right. off back in camp. After. <laughs> oh, I thought I thought we did the opposite, and we like escaped him from their two player show, which would sound cooler. <laughs> But you dropped him off. Yeah, that, that that that's that sounds interesting out of context. That... <laughs> what was that? That was for like Gaucho or something, right? Or was that a whole weekend that we did? That was a weekender because I I remember because um we had the last show we did was in Asbury. It was the Saint show, um the one where we <laughs> the first one where we met the Cloud Hands dudes. Oh, really? That was like our first one of our first things ever then. Yeah, yeah. Because the only show we played before that was like was at Mike Pearson's Carbone's house. pool. <laughs> oh, and Mike Carbone's pool. That's right. Was that the same weekend? I, it might have been the same I, weekend. I think so. Which one? Which one? The the Saint and Mike Carbone's house. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And do, yeah. I'm, I'm Facebook or Instagram gives you like flashbacks of stuff and. The other day, it was four years ago since we dropped the the Michigan trailer, where I'm sitting wow. next to Harambe, and you guys are like by my pool or whatever. And Eric was on the toilet. The, the Harambe incident is four years old already. Holy shit! 
Yeah, right? That's nuts. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, but it's cool because we're still doing stuff, kind of. It's like, <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? Like, that was like, like 2016 when we put out Michigan was like four years ago. Yeah. Weird, right? Wild. <laughs> if we all had kids at that time, the kids would all be four years old right now. That much oh is God. very true. Oh, wow. <laughs> it really makes you think. <laughs> if, if we had put out an album, that album would have been like four by now. Dude, uh, yeah. You're right. <laughs> dude, if we... Oh, no, I think the media was 2016 too, right? The I EP, thought that was 2015. Was it? Yeah, I'm pretty thought... sure it was 2015. I, I think know. that's right. Maybe I could be, I could be entirely wrong, but... Wait, you want me to look it up? I thought, I because I thought I thought we kind of like started Shark Club in like November. We should, we should ask somebody in the band. Don't we know? Don't we know Jake? <laughs> Lifeline, Lifeline. Somebody <laughs> called Jake. Russ, I was just thinking about that time we went into that dude's studio at his house, like the very first time, where like we literally had been practicing for maybe like a, a week or two. Yeah, I saw nightmares about that. <laughs> The guy was like, "Yeah, maybe you should guys should like practice more before you come into a studio." <laughs> We're like, "Yeah, you're right." <laughs> yeah, that was so funny. It was. It was. I don't know if I call it a waste of time, but it was something. <laughs> wait, wait, wait which studio is this? So there was, was literally this, just some guy's house. Yeah, we were right when we first started. This was like pre your days, David. Mm, Somebody, I saw, I saw an ad on Facebook. This guy's like, I'm giving like free studio sessions. Obviously it was to boost like, you know, people come visit his studio, see if they'd want to do a full album there. Sure. But we were like, you know, we, did, we didn't have one. <laughs> no. So we were like, oh, we have this song. It was a game theory. It'd be cool mm -hmm. to like get a real studio version recording. Cause we just did it on my laptop with the, you know, MIDI drums. So I, I do kind of remember this. I, I remember it vaguely now. Yeah, so we went, I think, should I say the name? I remember the name of the studios. We can bleep it out if you want. <laughs> I, was, I certainly don't remember. It was, it was this place called Skylab Studios, I think. Oh, in, okay. where It was Roosevelt, it was North. New Jersey? It was North. I, I don't know if Roosevelt that. is a place that exists, but yeah, it was North. But it wasn't too bad. It was... Like half an hour? Yeah, it was nice. It was nice. Just we weren't. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, I just remember, I, you know, because you grew up in, New, we all grew up in New Jersey, and I don't know what it was always like for you guys, but like for me, I'm always like, uh, music is really cool, but like there's nothing happening in New Jersey for music. But then I grow up and I mature and I'm like, okay, there's Asbury Park. While the scene's not as cool as it used to be, you think about Bruce Springsteen came from here. We're close to Princeton. You know, who from Princeton made it out and did some cool stuff. The guys from Saves the Day are from Princeton. And I'm really big into there's Saves another, the Day. There's another, like, Screamo band that is from Princeton, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if Saves the Band is... is I don't um, know if Saves the Day was from there, too. That's it. Um, it's really cool. And then and if you, you got, like... No, yeah, sorry, you go. No, not... I was just going to say, like, if you listen to, like, some of the early Saves the Day stuff, they reference just, like, a lot of places in Jersey. Oh, hell yeah. Do they it's reference really stuff cool. like like... Oh, from <laughs> <laughs> do they reference stuff like around us that like we would frequent in high school or something um i think it's just more of just towns like highland park they mentioned stuff like that um, i know there <laughs> <laughs> but um and i think and, and i listened to like interviews with the with the front man from saves a day whose name is escaping me i'm a fake man um, and he talks about an interesting name <laughs> He talks about, as a kid, always going to Princeton Record Exchange, which is really cool. It's really yeah. cool to hear. But, yeah. but anyway, I, I mentioned that just because I'm like, oh, this studio is so close to us. Like, wow, we can do so much here. Yeah. <laughs> Not really realizing it costs so much money to record in the studio normally. <laughs> and then, yeah, it was this guy's house, but he had a studio in his basement. It was like a full-fledged studio. It was pretty legit, and, yeah. and so he was this older guy. And you know what, you can Galaxy tell what kind painting of, on the on the wall. Yeah, like Saturn and stuff. But you can tell <laughs> a full like, wall portrait of like Saturn. Yeah, it was really we cool. We should have taken pictures. <laughs> but you could tell like what I kind did. of you can tell what kind of music this guy made. It was like, 
you know, the Bruce Spring wa Springsteen wannabes and the Bon Jovi wannabes would come through and, and do that kind of stuff. But in anyway, Jersey, unheard of. Unheard of. So this guy, yeah, he was nice enough to, to let us come in. And so it's, it's just us three. It's me, Eric, and Jake. And we, you know, we bring all of our equipment in, all the drums and everything we're setting up. And the guy's like, yeah, just set up. And he live tracked it, which again, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, watching all the studio blocks, my favorite bands. Oh, we're really going to like record to a click and like record everyone's things at once and spend the whole day on this. But it was just a free session. So he's like, you guys just play it live and we'll go from there. No click. And so I'm on the drums and I didn't practice. <laughs> and like Eric mentioned, we didn't really practice like at all. And so we do a full first run and the guy's like uh maybe you guys want to come back another day when you <laughs> practice <laughs> but long story short we did it another take and it was uh fine and it was on band right there we should have it was on band camp for like two <laughs> seconds and you can hear just like stuff isn't lined up because yeah. we didn't record it but it was a like, cool experience i remember like when uh like when i like when we were starting to talk about chart club stuff and then like eventually when I came into the picture, like yeah. I, I remember you were like, yeah, we recorded this version. Like, I remember you were like, we have this version. And it's like, it's cool. Cause we did it ourselves. Like it's actually us playing, but it's like the lot, like the one we did in logic in my house is just better. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's, that's real. I mean, <laughs> It's not the same thing because I was like you were like so green back then. Not to say that we're professionals now, but I, I I'm curious of what your thoughts on on this are, David. But mm -hmm. I always likened like it's really cool for me to be able to record something and then like handle everything myself, like mix it and all that. Because when you work with other people, while they can provide such great insight and other points of view, it's kind of like asking for a sculpture but your hands aren't molding it somebody else's are so when you know exactly what you want you can take care of it my problem is i was never like trained in mixing so i'm totally just mm -hmm. guessing and checking whereas like somebody else like, knows what they're doing it's just a little <laughs> difficult for me to get into words what i want from them what are you what are your yeah. thoughts on that i think that's a great metaphor to use like it's like you're telling the sculptor what you want like here's yeah. what i want this sculpture to look like but it's like i like they're at the end of the day it's their hands that are like actually sculpting out like what's in front of you um yeah it's totally a blessing and a curse For because sure. like like the way we're recording the shark club record right now like like we've talked about our vision with ethan like i like ethan's on the same wavelength as us as yeah. us like so it's too, like in this case, it's like, we know he understands our vision and we also feel comfortable giving him feedback. So it's like, like at the end of those, the day, like those hands, I still trust those hands that are sculpting. Yeah. I also trust Ethan's hands. Yeah. Well, I think we're lucky also in the regards, <laughs> we're working with our, our good friend, Ethan Farmer. Um, he's been so patient with us and we can, we can, you know, pigeonhole the one smallest aspect of the song for hours and mm -hmm. he'll sit through sit there with us to make sure we get exactly what we want so we are i think we're quite lucky in that regard yeah mm -hmm. and like i think his passion really comes through which is a, a really big part of it as well like sure you can tell ethan loves to do this so that's oh, something yeah. that makes me personally trust him so much more but i think it can become an issue when someone is like well, A, if you don't really know the person you're working with too well, and yeah. it's just like, they're treating it like um, just something they got to get through, like something got to fit, like, then it, it can kind of get tough. And you're like, well, we're not talking about like what my vision for the sculpture is. You're just trying to just chip away the, the, the marble and be done with it, you know? Um, yeah. So I think those vibes really have to be right from the get-go um and i think in, in our case uh that's not a it's not a problem for us because we trust ethan you know what's like the first artist you listen to where you're like oh this is really cool music in general is really cool um i think the two answers 
because when I was like a certain age, I like started listening to CDs and like noticing the CDs that my parents played in the car and like, oh, that's sick. I want to listen to that one. And I distinctly remember two of them that I would not stop listening to were the one Drake Bell record. I don't remember which one, but a Drake Bell album. I think it, it might have been the one with, with the Drake and Josh theme song on it. Um, and also, All American Rejects Move Along. Those yeah. two, I distinctly Classic. remember. Um, oh, do you remember you know, how old you were when, when you were listening to those? Or around what age? Oh, that's a great question. I, it was definitely like, like around kindergarten, I want to say. Oh, like, really? Like that, like early elementary school. Um, yeah, I don't remember too, too well. I, I just have a hard time remembering that time of my life in general, because my brain is bad. <laughs> well, so, I mean, I, I met you, we were both, there was only one year where we were both in high school, because I was a senior and you were a freshman. Yeah, and I'm friends with your with your brother Matt because he was in he was in my grade. But when I first met you, and tell me if I'm wrong, but this is the impression I got: you mm-hmm. were like only into um, uh, Layla, the record Layla, and like Pearl Jam. <laughs> I was so stoked on Pearl Jam. That was like, yeah, <laughs> I think like like Layla. I was like, oh, this record's sick. But like Pearl Jam was like. I would get on the bus I'd, to go into school. I'd be listening to Pearl Jam. I'd be sitting at lunch. I'd be, I'd be listening to Pearl Jam. I'd <laughs> on the bus home, listening to Pearl Jam. So, so what's going through your head between, you know, that stage in high school where you're into the Pearl Jam and when you first listen to Drake Bell and All American Rejects, like when do you pick up your first instrument? When do you kind of, did you have a sense back then that music is what you wanted to do like full time if possible? Or was that later in life? I think that feeling really developed in high school. Um, and I, I think like first thing, like first of all, I started playing music in school band. Um, yeah. Like I remember I played viola at first um, in like orchestra, um, excuse me, in like third grade. And then I remember fourth grade, I started playing percussion and I was like, like I, I remember I, I I picked both of them up like pretty easily. Um, like I, I kind of had a knack for it like, or, or I don't want to say easily, but it was like, I, I felt oh, like- I, Humble yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I picked up the drumsticks and I was, I was buddy rich from the get go. No, um, I, like it was the kind of thing where I was like, this is fun. This like, even if I wasn't great at it, I was like, it felt natural. I guess um, nothing felt like um, I don't know more than anything else. It just felt like I was able to be comfortable just doing what I naturally did. And then um, eventually that turned into me and one of my friends, um, a different Eric, uh, actually Eric Palermo. He plays in a band called Dumpweed now. Um, and like, he was my like best friend, like when we were real young um, and we like would get together and like, you know, we were like playing with like our Star Wars action figures or whatever, but we were like, then we were like, I had a drum kit and he had a guitar and we were like, yeah, we should like start jamming. And we did a little bit and then it like kind of petered out. But then uh, the, the history started happening. Like I, I was playing in jazz band throughout school and I loved that. And then in high school, I joined the high school jazz band and who do you know, but the kid who was playing guitar in that band was none other than Mr. Russell Sermonaro. Yeah, to be fair, there was like five guitar players, weren't there? <laughs> yeah, there, there was always like, you would have to like take turns. Like yeah. there were too many drummers, too many guitar players. Yeah, <laughs> I think I but, did it. I don't remember why I did it. I don't know. But yeah, how many drummers? <laughs> there was a lot of drummers too, weren't there? There was always three drummers and they would always do like, four songs so it'd be like one kid gets to play more than one song it was like always like this political battle of like i'm the older one and it's like but oh but i want to play you know constant <laughs> was there just one jazz band or was there like an, an advanced and a not so advanced yeah there was like i remember they they did this in like middle school too there was always like in our district there's always like 
one like lower jazz band and one higher jazz band. And like, I think it was a lot of it was based on age, but it was just like, I think it was if Mr. Kraft like liked how you play it or something, you know? Uh, but I don't remember, I think it was the higher one that we were in. I'd, ha I'd have to, cause I was, like I said before, I was a senior unless I was really bad, they would put me in beginner. But that means as a freshman, you were in the better one, which is pretty, pretty rad. Well, you know. <laughs> okay, Not so let me... Big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell this story because I only know it from my perspective. I'd love to know your point of view, but... <laughs> yeah. I had just joined... Not... I'd say my first, like, real band, like, where we wanted to write original music and play shows. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we were very, very just pop punk oriented, like some 41, good Charlotte were, you know, everyone in that <laughs> band's heroes at the time. And so we needed a drummer. And so everyone's kind of looking for a drummer. Of course, I'm looking the hardest. And in jazz band, I remember in one rehearsal, Mr. Kraft, who was running it, he goes, all right, um, David, who was on the drums, we need like a real big breakdown beat. Just something, just something like a breakdown. He kept saying breakdown. I'm like, oh, there's breakdowns in like pop punk music. <laughs> and so David just lays down this like sick beat and it's like thunderous in the room. And I literally was like, oh. <laughs> um, and I knew that David was Matt's brother, my friend Matt, but I don't think we've really ever had a conversation. And knowing me, I think what had happened next was I was too shy to go up to you and ask directly and i texted matt and i said ask your brother if he wants to be in a <laughs> i remember that that i will never forget <laughs> right, well, so, yeah, so, like what's your what's your perspective from there you got to take it from there dude i haven't thought about that day in jazz bands i think in in years it, it do you remember been... that do you remember that day i remember it now that you talk about it like like you're, you're talking about it and i'm like oh fuck that totally definitely that totally happened really um, yeah um because I, I remember like one day he was just like yeah like like he was just like i need someone to just play just he must have said like a rock beat or something like that just like yeah just just lay something down and i was like i i can do that i i like <laughs> drums so <laughs> well and, even i mean now that i'm older and i like a uh, more eclectic mix of music. Jazz drum is like one of the more, more technical things that you can do. It's really impressive to find a really good jazz drummer. And aside from that breakdown beat, you were crushing everything else. Those swings and those shuffle beats, it was sick. And again, here he is, a freshman <laughs> in the advanced a jazz freshman. band. <laughs> well, to be fair, I, I was also taking drum, I, I forgot to mention, I was taking drum lessons. Um, and that like obviously really helped because he was like, my drum teacher was like, you, you know, you have to practice, right? And I was like, no, come on, oh, come on. <laughs> in, a, in a world where like everyone, if they want to figure out how to do something, they just go on YouTube. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about lessons? Because I took guitar lessons the first couple of years I was playing. Right. What's your take on it? Do you, I mean, are they worthwhile? I think they, I think they really are. I think if you're serious about it, it's like, there's no substitute of like someone sitting in the room with you and just drilling you. I think that is invaluable, but it's also like really not easy to get. Like it, it, it's a kind of thing where like, we were so lucky because we had this great um, music lessons place like down the road from our high school. Yeah. Um, and this awesome drum teacher, Pat Petrillo running it. And I was like, like me and my parents were like, oh sick. Like it's right there. Um, so in that way, it was really convenient. Like we were lucky enough to, to the point where we could afford it. So, um, I think that part of it is, is definitely not like, it's definitely tough. Um, but I think like, if you have the, the resources and the privilege to do that and like, it's invaluable, you know what I mean? Um, I, I think you, it's not that you can't it, it, like get the same results without it, but I, it helped me immensely. Yeah. Did you ever do lessons, Eric? I was going to say, as someone who is entirely self-taught, I wish that I that I took lessons because I'd probably be a lot better. <laughs> no, you're but, sick. 
but like it's yeah but i but i would be better if i if i took lessons <laughs> well that's the thing is that the i think the other side of the coin though is that mm-hmm. if you take lessons you think about things from a pretty like um a relatively narrow minded point of view with music like mm-hmm. you, you think like i got to play in time i got to yeah uh 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 catch these phrases you're thinking very like very much like a player in an orchestra if that makes sense Mm -hmm. um but like i think without that without lessons i feel like so many of the people i've met including you eric have a much more broader view of music in general you're like i i'm not just necessarily like one musician out of many in this ensemble you're like oh like we should like jam, like just play some in free form. We should like just write this stuff ourselves. And like, I think you're much more open to like cool creative ideas if you have that um, more open-minded mindset. Mm-hmm. So like, that's something always, that I wish I had. It's always really fun to try and um, describe like a part of a song to you. Like when we're, when we're either writing a song or like practicing something out, I'll be like, oh, um, how about at that part where we do that thing? How about you do this thing instead of that thing? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea any words to use. I'm just, I, I'm like a caveman trying to trying to describe something. I always get a kick <laughs> out of it. And and you're you're usually pretty good at knowing what I'm talking about. So <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is that I like appreciate that. You don't need to know the language exactly <laughs> to know to pick up what someone else is putting down. You know, yeah. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's not that it doesn't help, but it's like you don't need it. So, but I think I think you hit the nail right on the head, David, because I talk about this regarding Jake a lot because Jake is all self-taught. And mm-hmm. he just started writing music on a whim, like never studied music theory or anything like that. And yeah, his outlook is so much more, is so different than mine. Because when I'm writing a song, I'm painstaking about, you know, like, is it in the same key? Can it follow this? Is it all in the same tempo? And Jake will just write something and it'll sound great. And then I'll go and try and transcribe and figure out what he's doing. And like, he's not, he's never just playing like a normal G chord. Like he added yeah. something just because it sounded good. And his, I'm always just like, that's against the rules, but he doesn't <laughs> even know the rules. So who cares? Exactly. Rock and roll has no rules yeah. for us. <laughs> yeah. Like, so that's what yeah. I love is that like, I, I feel like a, a lot of times like, uh, you and me will think about like, okay, this is a G chord in the G shape. And then it goes to an A chord in the A shape, you know, like, like that's how we think about guitar, but Jake's like, okay, here's like the main riff. I don't know. Like, this is just the riff. I know it sounds good. Yeah. My guitar makes a cool noise when my fingers look like this. But like, that is like, (laughs) like you, he's not like pigeonholing himself to like, well, this is the shape of a G chord, You, you know, like, it's, yeah. And then, like, you, without even really thinking about it, like, I might, like, he's come up with a, a, a chord that I wouldn't use. That sure. sounds it's like Bob stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> sick. Yeah, and it's, I mean, as a songwriter myself, it's inspired me to, you know, throw away everything that I know and just find what sounds good. Exactly. Which is interesting. So. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, go, no, finish your thoughts. Sorry. I was just going to say it's, like, I think the perfect combo is like recognizing both sides of the coin and kind of like, this is a a skill in itself, but like trying to put on a different hat of like, okay, let me like read notes now. Okay. Let, let me just turn my brain off and just play what sounds good now, you know? For sure. Eric, you too. But everything, all the good things I just said about Jake, it's the same for you. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I'll write that on a Hallmark card for you. <laughs> I guess, like, I, all the, all the, the lessons, lessons that I've taken is just like, just YouTube, YouTube videos yeah. on, on music theory that I, that I try my best to, to comprehend <laughs> and, and put into practice. But I've never actually like. Yeah. Not since like elementary school have I sat down with like a, a music teacher someone to actually teach me along all the all the training especially early on like i would just sit down on youtube and and just watch watch like just free lessons on on stuff like that and try my best to to figure it out on my own i will say this maybe eric you can say some something to support this or not i 
my my little brother when I was first picking up guitar, he was picking up the drums. So we had a drum set in my uh, in my house, and he kind of stopped doing drums. He was taking lessons at the same place you were, David. And once he stopped playing, I started getting into the drums because I was writing um, music. And so I was just teaching myself. And then my mom mentioned that I guess we had like prepaid for like a handful of lessons with with Pat over at the music place. And she wanted to know if I wanted to go take them. And so I did. And I thought it was such a worthwhile experience because he's like, everything you're doing is wrong. <laughs> like the way you're holding the sticks, everything like it is just flat out wrong. And I've always known the saying like practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So he's able to kind of get me out of like bad habits I could have fallen into. Um, mm -hmm. And so I feel like if I'm just learning on YouTube, no one's looking over my shoulder to make sure that I'm doing things perfect. Eric, you get such a sick, amazing sound out of your bass. You taught yourself how to do slap and everything. Like what, what are, like, what's your outlook on that? Um, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like, bass and drum are pretty pretty different in that regard well of course of course mm -hmm. um i don't That's know because there's just there's so many there's so many ways to uh, i feel like there's lots of different ways to play a bass whereas there's there's only like a few especially like like trained ways to play a drum you know what i mean sure yeah Touché. <laughs> i think like like um bass like it's certainly like like drums. It's it's like a whole dance, you know. It's like all the mm -hmm. movement. Like so, there's so many kind of precise movements that you can analyze. Mm -hmm. And I I think yeah. bass, yeah, it's definitely harder in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I would usually just watch like just watch concerts of of bands I liked. I would I would watch. I would I remember the first the first song I ever learned in full. I was was I got a feeling by the Beatles, and I would I would watch. I was like 14 or 15, and I'd watch that rooftop video. And I would just watch what Paul McCartney was doing, and I would I would try my best to kind of like, to kind of to kind of copy him. And That's then, its and own then as, education. As my as my music tastes and everything and everything grew and expanded, I'd be watching other people, and that's I kind of never never uh, stuck to one technique or another. I would you know I, I'd, I'd play a pick for for some songs. I'd try and uh, like Chris Squire on from Yes, just that 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 rip and pick sound. I always tried to to figure out what he was doing, and then stuff like Getty Lee with his with his really fast fingers, stuff like that. I don't know. I just like to, to try it all. I never really wanted to to uh, to just be stuck with one with one way to play it. I always like to try and play it in 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 every way. I love that. Like, yeah, that's versatility. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, and that's the Beatles. I've got a feeling, which is a cover of the Black Eyed Peas. I've got a feeling. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They actually little known fact. They, it wasn't a cover. They just straight up ripped it off. That you know that sucks. Yeah, uh, there was Paul McCartney gave no credit to Will I Am, Fergie, uh, Apple D App, or Tebu. You know what? That's so him, though. That is so him. <laughs> I you said those other two names, and the, you could have said anything, and I would have believed you. <laughs> That's not Will, fair. Will I Am, Fergie, Ronald McDonald, Orange Juice, <laughs> Orange Juice. and OJ. Fridge magnet. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because everyone's no like, for fridge magnet out here. It's I sad. Know. That's funny because everyone forgets George in the Beatles, but in Black Eyed Peas, you forget just like those other two guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they, so uh, Taboo and Apple D app are the are the George. I'm not done with this. <laughs> Apple okay, D no, app finish, and, finish it. <laughs> Apple D app and Taboo are the George Harrison of Black Eyed Peas. There, I said it. <laughs> well don't they didn't they both go off to have attempt solo careers uh, I don't know. come on man <laughs> my my knowledge of them is strictly black eyed peas based yeah <laughs> fuck i just know boom boom pow that's it okay so i'm a b come on man monkey business is album of the century <laughs> so <laughs> David Jarreau, um, he's discovered in jazz band. <laughs> um, 
and we'll fast forward a little bit. Um, David comes to um, our friend Bobby's basement to record, to, to have a practice run. We we're having a band practice and David came just to, you know, hang out and play some songs with us. And we it, was, it, it was Bobby's bedroom. Oh yeah, his bedroom. Mm. How big? Oh, it was so small. It was right? tiny, and I, I'll never forget that every practice we had, I like the drums just butt into the closet. So yeah. I'd just kind of be like sitting, like in the opening of a closet, like with the drums just coming, coming out. You know? Yeah. There was no room, but I also really liked that sense of it. Yeah. Right. It was loud as fuck, but it was like really fun. <laughs> It was a lot of fun. And so, again, we super pop punk, like we were all about, you know, those bands. And David comes in, he's really into Pearl Jam at the time. And tell me if I'm, if I, maybe I didn't know you as well as I thought I did back then, but we started mentioning bands like Blink-182 and Yellow Card. And I don't know whether or not, David, it was you've never heard of them or you've heard of them and you just never really listened to them. The one I did listen to was Green Day. I've listened to, like, American Idiot was, like, a big album for me. But other than that, like, y'all were like, have you listened to, like, Yellow Card, Blink, Good Charlotte? And I was like, I've heard of Blink. (laughs) Okay. And so, yeah, we would spit all those names at you, and you'd get confused and say no. And then because I'm the guy who recruited you, everybody else would look at me like, where did you find this kid? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> jazz band <laughs> jazz band <laughs> jazz band he really likes pearl jam <laughs> <laughs> i can play even flow like great like <laughs> that's so funny so i did remember that kind of correct then that's so funny well yeah I, I remember i went home and i was like gotta listen to yellow card or no 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 i, I think you were like let me get you like some like all of Yellow Card's albums. I got oh, yeah. you. Because for people who don't know, Yellow Card is probably my favorite band of all time. They're I'm like obs- obsessed with them. Genuinely, uh, like I think they're one of the greatest pop punk bands. Like for yeah. sure. Well, everyone just gets hung up on Ocean Avenue, but they have so many just solid, solid records, full albums. Well, that's another discussion for another time, how great Yellow Card is. <laughs> but, yeah, well, so maybe we were just desperate and we didn't know anyone else. Or I'd want to, I'd also want to say most likely probably what happened was while you weren't familiar with the music we were into, you picked up our original songs and the covers that we were doing really, really quick. And I'd like to say that you would press the rest of the guys enough to say, have them come back and we'll, like this will be the lineup from now on. Um, yeah. And so, I don't know, like what, what do you want to say about our time in, in that band? I mean, those were like oh, the first like shows I played, you know? Like, and that's the same for me. I think we experienced that together then. Yeah. Yeah, that was like, those are some really, really formative experiences, especially like, like we played like, a bar in New Brunswick like several yep. times like that was like oh so this is what the music business is like okay cool yeah like at, at least from like a ground up kind of perspective um I, I don't know it was like it was the kind of thing that in the moment was like the coolest fucking thing that was happening in my life you know oh yeah yeah like, it's exciting yeah exactly it's like i'm playing a show tonight on a wednesday night and i have a math final tomorrow like (laughs) you know felt awesome so for for people who aren't in a band would never have experienced this but you know you're a brand new band and you say um you you finally line up you're having a show whether it be at the bar in New Brunswick, Bobby's backyard, or somebody's <laughs> house, you say you're having a show, and then your mind just races, a, oh my God, literally everybody I know is going to be, maybe it's just me, but your mind races, everyone I know is going to be there, it's going to be like a sold out crowd, people are going to love my music, it's going to be great, and then you show up, and maybe three people are there. <laughs> Does that go yeah. through your mind? Because that, <laughs> it wasn't just the first time, it was like the first six times where it was so demoralizing <laughs> for me. Yeah, dude, I, it's, okay, Definitely yes. And okay, cool. 
first of all, let me say that even still to this day, like both think like that happens where I'm like, everyone I know is going to be there. I'm so anxious. And then on the same, like with the same breath, I think no one is going to come to this. Absolutely. No one is going to come. It's going to be the most embarrassing thing ever. My life is going to be ruined. Like those both thoughts at the same time, but it was especially demoralizing when we were playing at the bar because it was like 21 plus and we couldn't invite any of our friends. So it was like, no, yeah. Cause you're all in high school. All of us yeah. in high school. And like, while the shows were still fun, we were like, like my parents and my parents' friends are going to come see my yeah. pop punk band. You know, it was yeah. like, I think um, <laughs> the, one of the biggest lessons I took from that is that like 21 plus venues are just, I'm sorry. It's just, fuck, it, 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 it frustrates me at a, at a core fundamental level, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it was, it was with that band and even, even with Shark Club, we'd experience some bars would just be like, even if you're in the band, we're not gonna let you in. And I know your friends want to come, but they can't come either. And it's just like, just mark their hands. Like no one's going to try any funny business. Like they just want to come and watch, listen to the music. They'll buy some of and snacks. Like, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I totally, <laughs> I totally get the liability on their end and why it makes me right. nervous, but it's so fun. Like we played in Shark Club. We did, we, we drove an hour to Asbury Park to play at a bar. All of our friends came and then a lot of them had to turn around and go home because they wouldn't let them in. They almost that didn't let you in, David, and you were in the band. Yeah, I, I that was so frustrating because yeah. I, I remember like it was, it was uh, Jess, uh Ahan showed up um yeah and it was at this place that was like on the boardwalk and like yeah. I was carrying my drums in and the guy like it was a security guard outside he was like wait like who are you and I'm like do you see the equipment that I'm carrying yeah. it, like I'm carrying like not just like a bag that could be something it's like I'm carrying a kick drum like I'm, I'm carrying a drum what do you think I'm doing like um and it was just frustrating because like our friends had to wait outside on the boardwalk. They couldn't come in. I was so sad, you know? I remember we played that in, in our first band, we played that bar in New Brunswick for that, that for the first time. And my brother, who's your age, David, came with us to help load everything. I remember and that. the guys, the guy asked if he was in the band and he said, if he's not in the band, he needs to leave, which I don't, he didn't even have his license. Like, where was he going to go? I was his ride. Yeah, And so we tried to BS and be like, he's the tambourine player, but they weren't having it. So he had, I had to find someone who lived around there and see if he could just hang out there for a couple hours while we played the Damn. show, which sucked. I forgot about that yeah. part. Yeah, I didn't remember it until we were having this conversation. That sucked. But yeah, so I, when we were playing shows, like in my mind, show, yeah, it's fun for us as the musicians, but it's also a way to promote your music. And so when you're playing to a crowd of your parents and your parents' friends, they're not going to go back and check out your pop punk record on Bandcamp. Like exactly. it's kind of, it's a no win situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It feels so frustrating when it's not people your age, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think that specific detail is so important when you're like starting out in a DIY scene. If it's like, if you're playing for like, like if you're in high school and you're playing for people for, who are like 25, even it's like, this is, this is weird. I want to be playing for like, you know, people who like could be going to my high school. You know what I mean? Like for sure. So yeah. it, it's always frustrating like that. If you're playing in a DIY space, space, whether it be a basement or like a community rec center and, and th things are well organized, like, Kids come from out of the woodwork to come just to check out shows and have a good time. And it was, I, my favorite thing so far that we've been able to do as a band is, is do basement shows. And I think maybe right before we left our first band, David, we did do one. It was like our first basement show at Rutgers, I think. Is that true? Yeah, I want to say, <laughs> no, I think I remember it. I think... I, I could be mixing it up with the one Shark Club show we did at Pearson's house, but I want to say it was like, like kind of like a frat party. Yeah, like, you're 100% right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, for one of them, I remember some of my friends came, like, cool. like my age, and they like just did the party part of it and yeah. didn't do the music part of it as much. And I was like, oh, it's cool. 
All right. <laughs> but yeah, it was like, it was so weird getting started, especially in New Brunswick, because it, that line between frat party and house show is much more blurred than it is here in Philly. Yeah. Like, like, or, or at least at that point it was, it was like, people just like wanted to have a live band. So yeah. um, it was definitely really interesting. Yeah. Like the DIY scene is like so dependent on spaces like, like house shows and then the, like college houses where like you were saying, like uh, rack centers, stuff like that, just to be able to play <laughs> to not your parents and then their friends. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, as the resident of a, of a house venue, uh, do you want to give us some some insight on on what it's like, kind of like uh, from from booking booking bands to actually having them them come and like what 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 a show night looks like? Yeah, I mean, like, let me say I wouldn't know how any of this is actually supposed to operate if I didn't like go to college in a city and like get that experience, like being a freshman, like going out to like house shows and stuff, like that was really really great to like learn like oh like if this thing if this thing happens it's actually really lame and if like you know to just to learn like different kinds of house shows apart from each other too but anyway like for us like it's always been about like yo we want to help our friends bands like or, or just uh uh we just want to help people um like be able to make music and like be able to reach more people. Like, I think that is the way you have to look at it. Um, and so like uh, a lot of times it'll be like a couple local bands and then like a touring band or two, something like that. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. It, it like, it becomes kind of political with like, okay, who goes where in the lineup? Like, Mm. You know who wants to go first who wants to go last the whole nine. Oh, uh our guitarist is uh he's getting out of work he's he's still at work he's gonna get out in 30 minutes uh can we go last tonight <laughs> yeah 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 exactly <laughs> by the way this is like your first show you ever might, you, you have no and, you have you no songs on band with us. <laughs> yeah yeah it's like you're you've never played a show before you don't know anyone you're from like an hour outside the city you're like oh yeah like i know this is your first time booking us but like i don't know our guitar players <laughs> catching butterflies. Um, <laughs> is it cool if they come in half an hour? Could uh, you, David, could you take a detour for just a moment and, and imagine yeah. there's a listener who's not familiar with the concept of basement shows. Like when I first started playing basement shows, it was unfathomable fathomable to my dad of someone just lets you into their house and you play loud music. Could yeah. you could try and explain like what that's about and the community behind it? <laughs> yeah so first of all the thing we talked about before of like yeah yo i really want to play music i want to play it for like people my age like people like my friends friends like that kind of a thing instead and of like no okay. no pay to play which we've done before too yeah in that, our first band and no parents and no, no parents, parents. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's so weird it, it, it's like it requires so much trust and faith in other people um it's like uh uh first of all let me just say it's technically illegal um <laughs> it's, it's like and what is it it's more of a just a fire hazard right exactly it's just so th it's like you want to get around like an actual like venue like where you're gonna have to like be 21 to play or that kind of thing exactly. or like exactly a type of venue that wants you as a band to pay before you play, which is dumb as actual hell. Um, so you're, the ethos in mind is like, well, you know what? I know some people I go to a, most of the time it's at a college. It's like I live at a house off campus. I have a bunch of friends who go to my school. Why don't I just invite people? I can just do it myself. I don't need a venue. I can be the venue. And DIY, DIY baby. And then, uh, you pile people in your basement or your living room or whatever. Uh, and the problem becomes that it's usually too many people then should technically be allowed in there. Um, but then you just have the show yourself. All you need is what a, a, a PA system and Facebook and a contact list. And that's kind of it. Um, it's amazing. Uh, and 
I don't know. I think some of like the it, some of the most formative experiences of my life have been in house shows and stuff. For sure, um, and I mean, there's a lot of. I think it's a the basement show itself is a tradition that's. How old do you think that is? It's oof. way before I was even born. Like, yeah, hundreds like, of years. Hundreds <laughs> of years. Like even in just like New Brunswick, like which is. 15 minutes down the road from where we grew up like there's such a great 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 tradition of house shows in new brunswick like um yeah. that's like, like in the 80s they were doing that right yeah totally Before, like probably like um bands like uh screaming females like we're doing that um like don giovanni records yeah. like was started out of new brunswick like out of the new brunswick scene oh i didn't um, know that. Uh, did streetlight manifesto get their start from uh from the new brunswick basement scene too I, I don't know exactly, but that sounds right to me. Because um, I, I was less of a skyhead. We don't check our someone. facts here. We'll just, we'll just <laughs> go with it. <laughs> it's a fair guess. They're from East Brunswick, right? They might be, yeah. We're from, it's <laughs> yeah, fair sure. to say, we're from South Brunswick, and there's East Brunswick, and there's New Brunswick, and there's also North Brunswick. But there's no West no, Brunswick. There's no, no West. West. <laughs> but I think, like, the house show scene, another way I saw it was like an alternative to like Greek life kind of stuff. Like, For sure. I just personally never really messed with that. Like, I just always found Greek life to be pretty like, I don't know, it, it felt like a popularity contest and stuff. Like, it just felt like a high school extension. And I was like, I don't want to go to these parties. Like, I don't know, they feel like demeaning and stuff. I, I won't get too into that. But like, um, but I was like, I want, I still want to like go out and like, you know, party with my friends and stuff. And that's where a lot of my friends were going. They were like, yo, we're really, really into like the live local scene. And, and to be totally honest, that's a, a big reason I went to school in Philly period was because I knew there was a thriving um, independent music scene. Uh, so like, instead of going to a frat party on a Friday night, I'd be like, okay, what bands are in town? Like I'm still paying $5 to get in the door. Like, except I get to see some sick bands. Like, why, why would I ever go to a frat party? Do you um, want to talk about that? So hmm. you, you mentioned paying $5 at the door. Do you want to talk about how that profit, if you will, is distributed? I know, like, it's different for each house, but how are you running things um, from your point of view? Well, yeah, it's definitely uh, house to house. Um, the that breakdown changes just with different people but the way cafe lorraine has been doing it is that we always want most of the money to be going to the bands um and we just want to like like take a very small cut just for if we want to like upgrade our pa or anything like that um but the way we usually do it is like most of the money uh like we want to try to give it to the touring bands because a lot of times they're the ones who are like in immediate need of cash because they're on tour from far away. They need gas money. They need money for food. They need to pay for uh, travel arrangements, something like that. Um, so a lot of time, most of the money does go to those bands. Um, but you try to uh, keep it pretty equal, like um, try to pay uh, each band pretty similar amount of money. Um, and then like, take we take the scraps at the end for ourselves for ourselves um i i don't know exactly what percentage it usually is i want to say like something like 10 percent or something of the money goes to us at the end of the night usually um so like a lion's share of the money we want to go to those touring bands a little fun bit here if we have a little fun do you have any <laughs> horror stories of you know I mean, this isn't, you don't own this house, you're renting it, you're in college with a bunch of your friends, but do you have any horror stories of, you know, you're trusting to bring all of these different people in, some, most of them strangers probably, to your home? Any horror stories of something that probably went horribly wrong where someone was just being reckless and not um, respectful of your space? Well, thankfully, nothing like really bad happened at our house, but I know when I was a freshman and I would go to other houses, like, I remember there was this this one house in Philly, like off Drexel's campus called The Tip. And The Tip, like, um, 
It's the kind of thing where they would serve alcohol. It was. At it's house. just the tip. It's. It's just the tip. That's the name. It's. <laughs> it's the anyway. <laughs> Um, the tip would like serve like jungle juice and alcohol at this like at their shows which was like a blessing and a curse you got more people in the door but it's like not as many people were really there for the music so it's you know it's a mixed bag but mix it around know, here exactly that's the problem is that then you'll have kids who are coming to just kind of get fucked up um, and like when you serve jungle juice expect to have a jungle <laughs> yeah yeah expect there to be uh, some an old, an old proverb i once heard <laughs> and i think that's a perfect time to thank our sponsors jungle juice jungle juice i think Creator eric said this eric said the slogan if you could just repeat it uh if you serve jungle juice expect the jungle <laughs> now available in three different flavors david we got blue raspberry we got chocolate we got and red raspberry. Red raspberry. Yes, 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 yes. Um, Delicious. I don't know. We got <laughs> working on a worm flavor. I don't know. <laughs> working on actual jungle flavor. <laughs> We're working on understory flavor. We take the taste of an entire jungle and we bottle it up. <laughs> we got we got Venus flytrap flavor. We got we got vine flavor. <laughs> We got mosquito flavor. What more could you want? Spider web flavor. Spider web flavor. Um, what are those frogs that you lick if you want to get high? <laughs> frogs. Frog flavor. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking, I, I've been watching Avatar a lot, and there's the one episode where they have to suck on the frozen the frogs. Man of culture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. That's a good one. I, I've just been thinking about that, like I'm at, like sucking on a frozen frog to like be cured of your illness. Anyway, that's a total digression. <laughs> <laughs> we'll finish recapping his his uh, band career. We we get our we we get our feet wet with with our first band there, David, and then um, <clears throat> we start. I start Shark Club on the side. Those guys aren't happy about Shark Club and. Um, they, I was the side piece. <laughs> yeah. And they, um, <laughs> we leave, they ask us to leave. And then you come to Shark Club. Do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah. So I, I remember it was like, kind of going back a little bit, like we were driving home from just waiting practice and you played me game theory, like the demo that you and Jake had made. And I was like, this fucking rocks. And you were like, doesn't it? And and then later you were like, hey, like, would you want to, or I don't know if it was the same day or not, but you were like, do you want to like come help us out, play drums on it or something, like join the band? And I was like, yeah, yes, please. Um, and I remember like the more we did that, like, um, I don't know, there, there was, it was different. It was a different experience than playing with Just Waiting. Um, and I don't know, I, I, it was interesting that like why it felt different. I still have a hard time like uh, um, putting my finger on it. I think part of it was cause like y'all had gotten Eric and me and Eric grew up down the street from each other. And like, I remember like when I was in fourth grade and Eric was in fifth grade, Eric was like the cool kid on my bus. Like, whoa, <laughs> whoa. Like, and I was, the cool kid in, I was the cool kid in your jazz band, right? Yes, right? you were, yes, you were. Uh, but I remember um, Eric would like, like on the, sorry, Eric, but I, I remember on the bus, you would like do ultimate stunt where like, as the, the bus was like slowing down and approaching oh a stop, y'all would like be walking down the aisle and like just feeling the, the gravity. Like oh that my was God. like- Yeah, and the bus would, the bus would like slam, the bus driver would like always slam on the brakes and we'd just get, we'd like be walking a little bit forward from the back and we would just get like slammed forward and just like, <laughs> it was, it was really dangerous. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure the bus driver like supported it, which is why he slammed on his brakes so hard. And we would just kind of like go stumbling and flying forward. 
Yeah. That's so funny. It was it was really unsafe, but I I had a great time. David, was it high school or middle school where we were on the bus and we both had I don't know if it was our it was our iPhones or iPod touches, I don't know how how long ago it was, but we both discovered that we both had our passwords at 2112 because we were both really into rush. Yo, that was I think it was high school. I I remember that and I remember like I forget what exactly it was. I think you were like showing me something on your phone or something. We 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 switched. We were like looking at something on each other's phones, and like I had your phone in my hand, and I thought it was mine, and I went to unlock it, and twenty one twelve worked on it, and it was it was just like it threw me off for a second because it was like yeah, I don't know. It was it was crazy. I don't know. We just <laughs> had this moment where like it, it, I remember that's when like we knew <laughs> yeah, like it, it worked, and we just had the moment where we looked at each other like wait. Your your past wait what what the fuck? It was so sick. <laughs> so like Ugh. that like having that like 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 and we were both like into we both like grew up on like Rush and stuff like I think like the fact like we grew up on Rush and then like I also like had been listening to Green Day and like like All American Idiot or All, all American Idiot All American Rejects <laughs> um, like when I was younger so like I could relate like. Uh, uh, to the pop punk with Russ too and then obviously like joining the band and like playing good Charlotte and Blink covers like um, I just felt like there was a uh, a musical symbiosis and we were just kind of all on the same wavelength and it felt very natural you know um, for sure and, I think yeah yeah I mean I I you I mean you pretty much you you didn't know if you were going to hit on it and you hit on it I think really the difference between that first band and Shark Club is I was friendly with the other guys in that band, but we weren't like best friends. Right. It was actually like, David, we'd have practice and then the other guys in the band would be like, oh, you want to hang out? And But we were like never like formally invited. So yeah. you just leave. <laughs> yeah. And with Shark Club, Jake... I've known Jake since sixth grade. Eric and I used to jam and I really liked his style. And I've known, I knew you, David, because we were brothers in arms in the other band. And so, and yeah, you knew Jake because again, we're all friends with your brother, Matt. Yeah. Parents are friendly with each other. And you, so I think like it helps so much just to like be around people that you love being around. Totally. <laughs> okay. Here we are just kids. And we're in, sh we're in um, Shark Club. And in Shark Club, again, I think we were able to have a s similar experience as David and even Eric now at this point where we're playing basement shows on the reg. We're, we're making a name for ourselves in that community. We're playing weekenders where we're traveling and making friends with people in different states. What is that? How was that like an informative experience for you? Like how did that change your outlook on music, if at all? David? Um, I think it really like showed me how different this thing we're experiencing can be like from house to house, from city to city, from state to state. Like it really takes so many different forms and like people do it so many different ways. Like, um, and I mean that in, in terms of the music being played, like sometimes we would play shows somewhere and I'd be like I've never heard something like this before and I I'm in love with it like um I feel like there were a lot of like uh, um there's some kinds of music you wouldn't really hear in Jersey as much or like our kinds of shows you wouldn't like I feel like you wouldn't hear as much like indie pop indie rock kind of stuff it was kind of more like okay it's pop punk or it's like Hardcore. more like <laughs> hardcore metal kind of you know um in that respect but also like the different shows we played like uh uh the way they ran the show was different too um which really stuck out to me like um and like that's for so many reasons like in philly like people can walk or take the subway to a house to for a show and like you know in edison new jersey there's no subway you just got to drive you know so that like changes the kind of people that are there, like all these different factors that are like just inherent to like each different place totally changes the dynamic. And that was fascinating to me. That was so cool. Not to mention like 
yeah, sorry, not to mention like different kinds of bands and different, um, just different people meeting every time, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, you guys were, you, um, David and Eric, you guys were in high school when we first started. Um, and David grew up before our very eyes. Um, go to college. We called him McLovin at the beginning. Yeah. He looks like McLovin. <laughs> Yeah, um, you went to you go to college. You're studying. Um, what's the what's I mean? What's it really called? What you're studying? I don't want to get it wrong. The the name of the program is music industry, but it's like it's called so many different things by so many different colleges. Um, okay, but yeah. what you're studying more specifically, just like the engineering side of stuff, right? Yeah, I'm studying like sound and and music recording. Um, cool. Yeah. So, so, I mean, when I was in college, I met so many people that were interested in the exact same things that I was, and I was able to build really great friendships. That's obviously the same thing that happens for you. And along with Shark Club, you're also in a couple other bands, which I'd really just want to touch on. Let me just share this quick anecdote. I remember when we're first getting into the basement scene, how it works, meeting people who run shows, you and your brother, Matt, were so gung-ho about going to see this band called Harmony Woods. And you were telling me all about it, like, we're going to go see the show. It's going to be great. And I'm like, cool, dude. Like, you seem really stoked. I'm excited for you to go see. And you go see the show. And I ask you how the show was. And you're like, oh, my God. Harmony Woods is so great. It was such a cool experience. And now fast forward, and you're a live member of Harmony Woods. Am I, is that the best way to say it? I, that's right. I, it's so weird. I ended up joining that band. <laughs> um, it was, it was like very strange. Like the, the whole day was kind of weird. Like, this is really funny. My brother and I, like, um, I don't know, we're, we're both pretty neurotic people, my brother and I. <laughs> and so we were like, okay, the, on Facebook, it says doors at six music at seven. We have to get there right on time. We can't be late. <laughs> We will miss the bands. Like, not even really <laughs> realizing that punk time is a thing, and like this, these things are never on time. Yeah, so, if you, like if it says music at seven, you're lucky if music starts at eight. Exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like especially in New Brunswick, but I like uh, uh, we get there like right at doors, and like I like there might have been like one band that was there yet. And like the people who live there and my brother and I, like, that was like, we are so early. I feel so uncomfortable, like watching Harmony Woods load in. And I was like, ah, it's, this is so, this is so weird. But um, yeah, it, it was, it was really funny because it, it was like, I think that might've been one of the first like proper basement shows I went to. Um, and some of those people uh, I've been friends with since which is nuts. Um, yeah. And, and I, let's talk about, I mean, I don't know what the right word would be, but I'd say like Harmony Woods is a bit more established than Shark Club. So oh, yeah. when you're, what experience did you have like playing, playing shows with them? Cause you would, would go on full fledged tours, like across the country playing way bigger gigs than we would probably ever play. What, how, how's that experience like for you? uh it was kind of surreal it was like it's weird because like i was getting in on something like you said that was like already there and like they had already like played really awesome shows like you know they had uh uh like i remember th the really big thing to me was like oh they recorded at the metal shop with with jake from honor baseball and i was like really stoked about that um and like so it, it was the kind of thing where we met because we, uh, me and Sophia, uh, are in the same program at Drexel. Um, and she was like, Hey, I need a drummer for a tour or like, no, 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 no. What happened was my buddy Hank, um, who was playing bass, uh, uh, for her at the time was like, Hey, we need a drummer. Um, my, my buddy, David plays drums. We could ask him and, the rest is history. I, I, it was some show I was filling in for, and then they were like, oh, like, we like you. Let's, you know, let's get you in the band. 
Um, it's weird. It's like, I, I don't know, being uh, on like an actual tour is so strange and surreal and like doesn't feel like real life a lot of the time for better or for worse. Um, I don't know. It's, I was definitely prepared for it by us going on weekenders and stuff. Like that made it feel like somewhat of a ramp up. You know what I mean? But overall, very surreal. Very surreal. Because how long, what's like the longest stretch do you think you've, you've done? About two weeks is the longest I've done. Um, and it gets tough. Um, I, 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 uh, I did like a tour with them that was more like, DIY houses, like more like kind of low key basement shows. Um, and we also did some shows that were like, we were supporting another bigger band um, that were like at actual venues and stuff. So it's like, um, I don't know, like the one, you're still like, you know, looking for like a couch to crash on for the first one. But then for the second one, when we're like going to motels and stuff, it was like, we can do this. Like, uh, okay, I guess we can. It, it, it's just like, I don't know. It feels like you're, someone's giving you something. I don't know. It, it's so hard to describe, but it was like, oh, here you go. Now you get to stay in a motel. And I was like, sure. All right. Fuck it. Like, I, I was so stoked about that. Like, you know, not focusing on like <laughs> the, how like strange it is for a human being to be sitting in a car all day every day you know <laughs> so I, I i was just really exciting too let's talk about people on other planets real quick <laughs> who wants to who wants to have that conversation i'll let eric I, start okay. that. no let me yeah, let me introduce it let me introduce it <laughs> my two friends eric and david and our other friend tim have started one of the sickest bands i've ever heard of in my life take it eric <laughs> um, okay, so this is a callback to my other story where I brought up uh, my friend Tim Burke. He's still he's still with us. <laughs> um, so uh, so we after high school we worked at a little uh, at a little cafe together for maybe like a year. Um, so that was probably like 2017. And then after we both left that job, we kind of um, like didn't really hang out. Didn't not nothing really happened. We just kind of like fell apart. For, not fell apart. We just kind of had like a yeah, no, we just grew apart a little bit for maybe like another year after that. And then um, we started hanging out again. Um, Tim uh, was showing me just some some new stuff he was working on. And I was just like really blown away just because um, he had started um, playing guitar without a pick, just just kind of like flamenco, flamenco strumming. And also he had changed his guitar tuning um, to, uh, away from standard, uh, we, we wouldn't even have a name for it. Cause it's not, it's not really like a, it's not a, it's not a, a regular, uh, tuning thing. And it gave it just really cool sound. He, um, he, he uses his uh, whammy bar at, when he strums in a really cool way, just gave it a really unique and interesting, uh, sound. And I immediately, I was just kind of like blown away. I was like, Oh, that shit is so fucking good. Like we gotta, we gotta start doing stuff with this. And then it took a long, long, it took maybe like another, another year before we actually started like sitting down and actually like writing and fleshing these things out. And, um, and the stuff we were writing, it was, um, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit more out there <laughs> in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, music, we were, we were kind of experimenting with, uh, shifting time signatures, uh, shifting yeah. tempos, just like writing uh just writing just kind of wonky stuff i'll say <laughs> right because well, um, y'all were like really like stoked on like bands like primus and stuff like yeah yeah like, so it's pretty much yeah birthed from um from from our love of, of weird stuff like primus um uh or my my initial love for for stuff like rush and yes and those kinds of uh those kinds of proggy things um, King Giz. Tim's Tim's love for the same thing. Actually, it was funny. We didn't we didn't get into King Gizzard until we actually until we were already like writing all this stuff. Oh, okay. We really? had a lot of this. It kind of yeah. It, it so um yeah. So King Gizzard definitely helped us down that path. But we were already on that path before we discovered them. It was because we were on this path that we got so into them. Yeah. Um. But they but yeah, they, were they definitely. One. Yeah, they definitely became a huge inspiration for us, especially with the with a lot of the time signature stuff. Um, but um, 
and yeah, and we're and we're and um, we needed uh, we don't know many drummers, but we needed a drummer who could handle that kind of um, we, we pretty much wanted to torture David. <laughs> <laughs> So we wrote we wrote all these crazy songs and we're just like you know what we just we just are sadists for drummers and we really just want one drummer to just really really suffer. <laughs> <laughs> but little did they realize that I'm actually a masochist for that shit. Like I love it. I was like So it was a it was a match yeah. made in heaven. Um Yeah. Yeah, and um and our love for um for for like we said stuff like rush and and genesis and and stuff like that like uh like conceptual albums of the of the 70s um yeah. mixed with our, our recent our recent discovery of of, of king gizzard and and, <laughs> and their uh, album lore uh inspired us to do like kind of like a, a to try out that kind of like a conceptual uh kind of progressive rock album eric do you remember what song you showed me first or like what of of this stuff you showed me first yeah it was it was i'm i'm pretty sure it was postal p um because yeah, that was yeah, the yeah, first yeah. that was the first riff that 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 uh that tim showed me it sounded to me it sounded like um foster's home for imaginary friends on acid <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i, I remember yeah, you just, uh, you were throwing around like yo we're going for like a space cowboy vibe and I yeah, was like, pretty much. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, so, we're calling what? it um we're calling it progressive punk space twang. Prog punk space twang is is the is the genre that we're calling it because we we, <laughs> we have no other we, we really don't have anything else to call it. What do you guys have on Bandcamp right now? I know it's not a lot, but um, there's some stuff, right? Yeah, we just have one uh so yeah, the, the sad part is um this this spring, like um from, from January up, up until March, we were at our most, like the three of us, we were firing on all cylinders. We were yeah. at our most, um, what's productive. the word? Our most productive. We were recording. Yeah. We were in the studio with Ethan. We're practicing. Um, the same, the same uh, producer who was working on our Shark Club stuff. We were booking shows. We played a handful of shows um, for the first time as a, as as that group. Um, one of uh, which we were, was we at Cafe Lorraine. Support. Yeah, one of which was at was at his house. <laughs> which I, I mean, I've been lucky. There. I'm one of the few lucky people in the whole world who have been able to see you guys play live. And you have so many great, great songs in your catalog that have yet to be released. I wouldn't yeah. say so, so many. <laughs> How many? How many we do you think you guys have like, written? We can play for like 25 minutes tops. Well, um, the album that we're working on, we it's completely written and uh, a lot of it is recorded. It's nine tracks. That, and, and you know um, what? Just one of your songs, the complexity of it all, it's like the same for me writing like six songs for just to fit into one song. So yeah, I'd mm -hmm. say you guys do have a lot of material. Mm -hmm. that but, um, but yeah, we were at our most productive. We were, we were starting to play shows. We were, we were, we were making our way, we were making our way downtown. And then, um, and then COVID uh, happened. Corona happened and we, <laughs> and um, yeah, we're just kind of sitting on on all this stuff now, waiting for um, waiting for um, David to be kind of uh, open and not done with school, so we can uh, continue uh, recording and stuff. No rush. It's just <laughs> take your time. <laughs> it, it was just so hard because we were like, we had a system going with Ethan. You know, we were like working out of Drexel Studios, um, mm -hmm. like, and like another studio he had access to, and like. Mm -hmm it was sick and we were like we can do this this is real and then uh, yeah yeah, well, yeah it was especially frustrating um for me and tim just because um it had been like like two or three years since tim even even showed me that first song and then it took another another year and a half two years to even to even make a full version of that and then all of a sudden we were moving so quick and we had everything down we were doing so good and then Mm. like i know it's bigger than just <laughs> i know it's bigger than just than just uh than just us not being able to write our sick tunes but it was a little it was a little bit of a bummer sure well i mean shark i mean we experienced it at shark club too we were every weekend we'd make the trip to philly to write yeah. our new album um but i also i mean one of the main reasons why we're talking to david today is i, I mean this is pre-recorded but today um the day we're, we're recording sandboxing which is your other 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 band who are great i love sandboxing so much 
you just released a brand new EP. Was yeah. this? Well, it's actually like a, like a everything we've done so far. Um, yeah, well, so, I mean, these yeah. are songs that I've heard live before that I could not wait to get studio versions of and they did not disappoint. Mm -hmm. But clear it up for some folks, like, was this a COVID project? Were these songs that you had recorded and COVID just kind of brought you together to mix remotely? How did that process go? Yeah, so, well, sandboxing was like, started in when I came to college and we were yeah. like, we're gunning throughout like uh, our freshman year and stuff. Um, but our, our sophomore year, the last, like, I want to say three tracks on the album we just put out are like, um, like we had put out one EP and we were like, okay, these three tracks are going to be EP two. Awesome. Um, and they were like pretty much all recorded with our, uh, our buddies, uh, Chance and Tanner. Um, cause it was like for a school project for, for a class, but we were also like, well, let's use this to record our EP. Um, and we just sat on those recordings for like such a long time. Um, like we had them like almost done, but it was like everyone was so busy with one thing or the other that we like just didn't really get around to it. And like also the band kind of like stopped. We stopped playing shows with the band. We like just uh, uh, school and stuff just got kind of too much for all of us. And we we're all involved in different projects. So kind of came to a halt in that way but we were still sitting on these songs we had recorded. So we were like, we really want to put it out at some point. And when uh, coronavirus happened, it was like, it gave us a chance to be like, yo, like now is kind of the perfect time for us to like finish that. And, and then we started talking like, you know, we also have like messed around with recording other songs of ours or like there's songs we like have on YouTube that we don't have actually out. So why don't we like do a, a retrospective kind of a thing, like um, everything we've done so far, just get all of it out. Um, so there you, there you have it. We, it took a little bit of, um, you know, we had to push ourselves to do it. And it was, it was a, a, a tough situation of like, who has the Pro Tools files and who like has mixed it before because like Chance had done it, not like one of us. And then it was just little things like that that would delay us for quite a long time. So eventually once we did get our shit together, it was like, okay, this is, this is real again. Um, and our buddy John is uh, from fire hazard records is printing the cassettes and that's really sick. That's really, really exciting. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm stoked for you guys because I, I mean, I knew that this, EP was in the works for so long. It's just a matter of when are they going to get together and, and finish it. It sounds sonically so, so, so great. Thanks, um, dude. I know, I mean, at this point, again, by the time we're recording it, the EP is only like a couple hours old, but have you gotten any feedback? Is this kind of like putting fuel in the sandboxing engine of maybe we should be doing more stuff? Is it too soon to say for all that? Uh, I don't know. I think, I, I hate to say it, I think it might be it for sandboxing, <gasps> at least for the, for the near future. Eric, we got um, some scoop. Yeah. Because it's... <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> it's, I, I, especially because we can't play shows, you know what I mean? Like, it's, mm. it doesn't feel like we're able to do too much. And, like, for, like, before quarantine, like, for about a year or so, we were like just not active because again, all of us just had other stuff going on. Um, and I don't know, it, it just kind of slowly became apparent to all of us that like, okay, it doesn't seem like we're, we're all as devoted to this as we were in the past. And that's okay. Like I, um, you know, in that kind of a situation, it's like, I don't ever want to be mad at my bandmates for that. Cause like just, life happens and like you know we're all part of the same program so we're all doing music all the time always so it's like it's not easy so i'm not a, a i certainly don't like uh, um have any like ill feelings towards those those guys at all um and let me just say that hank finished up like sonically like he mixed um the the everything to completion like um 
he uh, uh, basically finished up all the material for this record and he did like a fantastic, fantastic job. Um, I think Chance might have been involved a little bit. I, I, I forget exactly. I can't speak to how much he was, but um, Chance originally uh, uh, recorded it and stuff and it was sounding good from the get go. So he had good stuff to work with, Hank. That's awesome. And I mean, Eric and I know everybody from sandboxing. Not only are they great people, but they're so talented at their respective instruments. Um, mm -hmm. But how did it feel for you to be in a band where you weren't behind the drum set? Well, it was definitely a change of pace. I'm, I'm really used to like a specific role and that's playing drums, holding down the rhythm, sitting in the back. Like um, I was so used to that for so long. And, uh, and then I joined sandboxing and like, ended up being the vocalist. And I was like, cause I, I've like sang just kind of like casually for a while, just like, you know, just like in my car or whatever. And then I, I joined sandboxing. and was just kind of singing a bunch and they're like, you should sing in the band. And I was like, okay. Um, it was weird. I didn't know what to do with my body in front of like playing in front of people, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm not singing right now. Like this part of the song, Hank's singing. Do I just look at people? Like what the heck? <laughs> don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what do I do? I don't know. But it's, <laughs> I really dug that like discomfort though. Like I think exposing myself to like new musical territory just really excites me, you know? Um, yeah. That's a great outlook to have. Yeah. I, it's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of uh, blessed in that way where I just, I'm, like hungry for more musical situations like that. So I was like, um, you know, uh, it was just a different way of knowing people were looking at me on stage. And then on top of that, I, I got to sing and flex a different instrument that I don't ever use and fuck up at it a bunch, but you know, that's part for the course. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, uh, do you want to talk about your time as the bass player for Psychic Agency? Since, uh, you've <laughs> what pretty is much that? played in every single band, playing every single instrument. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that, that I can cover that one a little bit quicker because it was pretty casual. It was like, I've never heard was, this. Oh, it, so it was just my, my buddy, um, Alex from, uh, from the same program it was like, Hey, I, I have this band, it's like kind of more R&B, kind of more uh, um, like indie pop kind of. Um, and he was like, uh, we need a bass player, we just need someone to fill in, or actually it might've been my friend Cece who was also playing keyboard in that band. She was like, hey, we need this, uh, uh, like a bass player. I think you play bass, right? And I was like, yeah, I play bass. And like, That's easy I, enough. <laughs> yeah, or, or I was like, I had played bass a little bit in the past and I was like confident enough to do it. And there you go. I filled in for a couple shows and then they're like, yeah, you should keep playing with us. And I was like, okay, cool. Oh, I, like I remember this now. That's right. I, yeah, only, yeah. I only brought it up because I went to one of their shows and I saw David play bass and it was sick and they were sick. Was it how much, how much bigger was awesome the guitar compared to his body? <laughs> I, I cheated. Actually, I was a short scale. So. I was playing a short scale. So I cheated. That's hilarious. I made fun of him for it. Don't worry. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Maybe we could talk a little bit about David's future because we talked about past, present. We totally don't have to talk about this. We could just end the conversation here. Is it worth talking about We're Not Brothers at, at any scale here? What do you guys think? I'm down. Um, I say it's up to you guys. I'm when, when I, feel, I feel bad to keep, like, to keep talking about it and keep teasing about it if like, it's not going to be coming out soon. You know what I mean? I think we'll just, we'll just end it with the three of us had conceptualized something. It's been in the works for a couple years now, but it's slowly been sure and surely coming into fruition. Um, it's mm -hmm. a musical. It's got a film aspect to it and a whole backstory that we're really, really excited to, to share with people. But we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of our friends be in on it and um, play along with us. Members from Poop or people on other planets, members from Sandboxing, um so all the people from who've joined us along the way are helping us and um i mean i'm excited you guys were just telling me how excited you were 
Yeah. Um, so hopefully we could talk about it in a bit more uh, specific specificity. 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 Uh, anemone. Anemone. Yeah. Soon. An enemy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Hell yeah. Do Do you want to do like a quick little like game thing or something, and then like end with that? <laughs> okay. Like okay. Quick quick round of this or that. Eric presented this or that. Go ahead. Okay, guys. This or that. Toby Maguire, Tom Holland. I got to oh, go with the category is the category is Spider-Man. <laughs> I should I should have, I should have specified. <laughs> I I got to say Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire. Just un, just that's that is Spider-Man in my brain. Okay, you can you can remain my friend. I'll agree. I'm I'm on the Tobey Maguire train too, but I will say I do like Tom Holland a lot. You, you know what I will say is that Tom Holland is better than Andrew Garfield. I, I didn't even include him in the, in, the, in, the, in the debate. <laughs> That's fine. Rightfully so. The correct answer is Tobey Maguire. <laughs> <laughs> Russ, we're putting you on the spot. <laughs> I'm trying to think of this or that. <laughs> hey, Russ. Green or not green? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one for you, Russ. Yeah. Blink. Or yellow card? Oh, that's easy for us. I think yellow card. I knew it. <laughs> what do you Fair think, enough. Eric? Blink or yellow card? I say yellow card. Are you just yeah. saying that to make us happy? No, <laughs> no. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a huge. I'm not huge on Blink. Like, I like their popular songs, but overall, like, I, if I had, if I had to listen to only one of them for the rest of my life, I would, I would choose yellow card. Yeah. I, I will say that Blink, like, uh, uh, it's definitely like a high school band in my brain, you know? I got no beef with Blink. Don't get me wrong. I got no I got beef no, with Blink. I got no beef with Blink. No, I don't, no even, don't even have poultry with, with Blink. Eric and I met Mark Hoppus. <laughs> yeah, Mark Hoppus took a picture of me. <laughs> it was so, that was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's a story for another day, guys. Just, yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Oh shit! Yeah, Mark, um, if you're watching this, I know you are. You're an excellent photographer. <laughs> okay, ready? Um, wing, wings, boneless, bone in, bone in, bone in. Okay, okay. You I'm know what? In. I'm I'm gonna be controversial and say boneless. That's fair. Both are good. They, There's no wrong taste, answer. They taste different, though, right? Yeah. Well, well okay. Yeah. It's like a Coke in a bottle versus Coke in a can type of thing. Yeah. Well, the, oh, yeah. the, the boneless tenders are just like chicken nuggets, pretty much. They're just... Yeah. That's kind of what I love about it. It's just the, is the... Yeah. That's I why thought, I can't really go wrong. I thought, <laughs> I thought what you were going to ask was wing or thigh. Uh, I thought you were gonna ask flat or drumstick, which is flat. what I literally just said. <laughs> well, well. No, you said you said you said you said. Are they different said, wings and thighs? Like thigh. No, I they're think... both the wing. One is just the one is just the part that connects to the body, and the other part's the oh. the little. Okay, yeah, um... flats, but, flats or drums is more universal. Well, when apologize. you say wing, when you say wing or thigh, I think of like a whole like piece of roasted chicken. You know what I mean? Like yeah. instead of okay, wing. yeah. Let's not think about KFC. Let's think <laughs> get about your, like, get your chicken, get your poultry wings. parts right, Russ. I'm sorry, that was me being okay. Ignorant. Can we start a hardcore band and call it Poultry Parts? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just sampling Mrs. Fowl from Jimmy Neutron the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I okay, wings are fl or, or, or drumsticks or flats. I. I think I'm not too partial to one or the other, but I've heard people, I know people who are like, get that drumstick shit out of here. I'm only eating the flats. Like, <sighs> I, right. I would say drumstick, but 
a few years ago, I learned how to effectively eat a flat, and that really changed the game. Like you, you find the it? you find the joint, you like twist it a bit, you pull out the small bone, and then you pretty much can just like pull the meat right off right off the thing in one in one slide. And since I discovered that, since I was taught the correct way, <laughs> eating the flats has just become so much easier and honestly a little bit fun. Yeah. I I'm content with just eating it like side 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 keep flipping it. My dad, he doesn't do your method of the heal it, but he's able to stick it in and then pull it out and there's no meat on the bones. I have no that's, idea how he does it. That's also pretty baller. That's that's a that's a pretty cool move. I, yeah, I, I would wish also, I could do it like that, but I'm af- I'm afraid I would literally just like inhale and swallow <laughs> inhale or swallow the bone. I would also describe I would trust myself. <laughs> That's the definition of baller, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, this is another thing, and this relates to something that, like, my family was talking about. When you eat corn on the cob, do you go, uh, 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 like, receipt roll? Or do you go typewriter? Receipt roll. Typewriter is oh, only typewriter. done in cartoons. I've never seen anybody do typewriter. Russ, life. you do typewriter? I, hell yeah, I do typewriter. You kidding? You're a cartoon character. Because <laughs> <laughs> my my mom texted me a video or something of my little like six year old cousin eating uh, corn, and it's just chaos. It's just oh, oh. <laughs> oh no. He's it's like he's playing Minesweeper. <laughs> he's feral. He's kids feral. It's okay. I love him. I had Russell, a phase. You need to you need to eat corn like an adult. <laughs> I had a phase for a while where I'd take the corn on the cob and like shave the corn off, just because I, I feel didn't... like every kid went through that phase. I wasn't about getting it all as in my a child. Teeth. It's yeah, it's hard. To, yeah, it's hard for children to 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 get that to get that down. I wasn't big on that when I was young. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Though. I was also uh, I made my mom cut the corn when I was little. Mm. Yeah, poultry every parts now and then. opening okay. opening for cut the corn. <laughs> That's our first record, actually. <laughs> cut the cut corn, the corn. cut the corn. Bah, bah, but bah, that's bah, after bah, the self-titled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then it's like, <laughs> don't give me no drumstick. <laughs> don't give me the flat. <laughs> this thing writes itself. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I should. I, I should remove music. it from the podcast so nobody steals our idea. Too late. I'm gonna steal it. I'm gonna sell it to another podcast. Hey, Joe Rogan, here's the song I have. <laughs> you want my song, Joe? It's my impression of a man selling an illegal thing to Joe Rogan. There's a lot, David does a lot of impressions. I can't stop. It's, I have a problem. <laughs> this man needs help. <laughs> I am sick. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. I um, hope you enjoyed uh, hearing David talk about uh, everything. He has such a way with words. He has all the ways with words. And he has that, that timbre of his voice that's so soothing on a podcast setting like this one. He should do ASMR. I would listen to it. He should, among other things that he should do on the internet. <laughs> like more music. <laughs> Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Yeah, thank you so much. We should, I feel like at the end of these, um, I want to put, like, a full song of the person who joins us. What full, I think it should be one of the new sandboxing songs. Which song should we should we play? Uh, my vote's for Mambo's number one through four. Yeah? Let's <laughs> yeah. do it. All right, well, without yeah, that, further ado. That's do, my favorite. Okay, cool. Check out their their new, I can't say EP. I'm at anyone when I said that. Check out Discography it's by... A, it's a collection. It's a collection. Check out Discography by Sandboxing. It should be on all streaming platforms and, and all that other cool stuff. Without further ado, here's Mambo's number one through four by Sandboxing. Uh, we hope you enjoyed your stay in Soundtown and uh, come back soon. my
might not be.